If you have Bibles with you or if you have your phones where you have Bibles accessible, go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a succinct summary of everything that we have read and sung thus far this evening. The Apostle Paul, writing to Timothy, says this. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. This is a succinct summary of the message that we love, Christian. The gospel message. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The sentence is so simple and yet so incredibly profound. Three truths that I want to draw our attention to this evening about this passage, three truths that we must understand about this statement is its trustworthy nature, its anticipated Savior, and its gracious rescue. Regarding its trustworthy nature, the trustworthy nature of this statement, Paul never wrote anything false in the scriptures. But he introduces this truthful statement with some extra assurance by saying that it is a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance. And so what God is saying through Paul in this statement is worthy of being believed in its entirety without hesitation without any reservations or apprehensions whatsoever. This statement is completely true and ought to be treated by su as such by all of us. This statement deserves our entire acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Do you believe that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners? Do you believe that? Do you believe that statement without reservation, without hesitation whatsoever? Would you stake your eternity on that statement? Have you staked your eternity on that statement? The statement that is made here is about an anticipated Savior, Christ Jesus. Up to this point in this letter of 1 Timothy Paul has already used this phrase, Christ Jesus, six times. And each time that he uses this phrase, implicit in that statement is what the Old Testament asserted about this coming one, the Christ, the Messiah. Jesus, <laughs> implicit in that, is what is also newly revealed about him, like his name, Jesus. This long-awaited one was called in the Old Testament a king, a savior, a servant, a priest, and God's choice messenger. He was the one who spoke for God throughout the Old Testament. He was the one throughout the Old Testament who spoke not only for God, but also as God himself. And this unique one finally came decisively as the man, Jesus of Nazareth. Notice what we read that this Christ, this Messiah named Jesus, came into the world. He had to come into the world. He had to come into the world because he was not of this world. He already existed outside of this world, outside of time and space, outside of this worldly realm. He was God, he is God, and he had to become man. And for what purpose? The purpose was this, to save sinners, to save sinners. Simple three words, to save sinners. This is why Christ came into the world. Jesus did not come into the world to meet felt needs. 
Jesus did not come into the world to improve people's self-esteem. Christ did not come into the world to prove the immense value of human worth. Jesus did not come into the world to overturn systemic injustices. And he did not come into the world to ensure that all religious preferences could harmoniously coexist. That is not why Jesus came. Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, came into the world to save sinners. That is why he came. Being saved implies that there was a life-threatening danger present. And in this case, it was the eternally life-threatening, dangerous wrath of God from which all sinners must be saved. Psalm 7, God is angry. He is a righteous judge who feels indignation every day towards sinners. Jesus came to save sinners from that anger, from that wrath, from that right justice. It's not difficult to convince people that they are sinners. People will usually freely admit that they are not perfect. Few people are such bold liars that they would claim absolute moral perfection. And yet the question is not whether or not we would admit that we're some type of sinner. The question here is, are you the type of sinner that Jesus came to save? Are you the type of sinner that God calls a sinner? When that term is used, do you agree with God's definition of being a sinner? And we don't have to go far from our context to discover what God thinks about sinners. If we look back just up at verse 9, where Paul has to explain the good use of the Old and New Testaments, that we might live a righteous life by all of God's word. He says this in verse 9, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for who? For those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. Notice that the term sinner appearing in verse 9 is included in the midst of a list of people who are ungodly, profane, parent-killing, murderous, lawless, immoral, homosexual, lying kidnappers. Sinners. Would you put yourself, as you stand before God, in the same boat with these people? Because that is what God thinks about sinners. When God describes sinners and thinks of sinner, they belong in a list like this. Do you agree with God that you belong with these people? You deserve the same condemnation as people who would do something as wicked as kill their father or mother. We do. God says we deserve his just condemnation. Yes, all sinners before God belong in the same boat, in this same list. And in case we're confused that our particular preference for sinning may not have been mentioned in this list, we should notice that he says at the end, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, verse 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Anything contrary to sound teaching that produces righteous living, what is written in God's word, that is the type of sin. Those are the type of sinners who are condemnable before God. And even though that's true, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That is good news. And we are not deserving, worthy of that good news, 
but this good news is worthy of being fully believed by us. That is why we make such a big deal about Christmas, about the gospel, even when Christmas has long gone in its past. December 26, we'll make a big deal about the incarnation because Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Without that, we would have no hope. And if you don't believe that, if there is any reservation in your mind about the truthfulness of that statement, about the kind of sinner that you are, or the just condemnation that you deserve, then believe what God has said and be saved. And if you have any questions, I would love to talk to you. The elders of this church would love to talk to you. Our members would love to tell you more about how you can be saved and believe this message. We have one more song that we're going to sing. I'm going to pray for us. God, thank you so much for this good news. We would have no access to eternal life. We would have no hope of escaping your wrath forever in hell because of our sins. If you had not sent your perfect son to die a brutal death on the cross that he did not deserve, enduring wrath that would have taken us all of eternity to exhaust, that we would have seen, never seen the end of, And so we rejoice, God. I pray for those among us who may not believe this message, that you would convince them of the sin that they have committed, that it is worthy of your condemnation, and that you would rescue them and make Christ Jesus their hope. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.